author of Mind Moves and Baby Jim, and she's also the author of numerous books. So we really look forward to hearing what you have to share with us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Melody, for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Always an absolute delight to spend time with um, ECD colleagues and practitioners and teachers and lecturers and the like. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about creative art. We're going to talk about coding and we're going to talk about creative art is a form of coding or as a form of coding. What I am not talking about, because I point blank refuse to show you even, uh, um, what do they call it, a worksheet. I'm also not talking about coloring in pictures that children just slap some pictures on. Absolutely not, that's not creative art. Yes, it has value when you want to impress parents, but did the child think of the shape of the duck? Did the child position the duck on the page? Did the child think of where do you put the beak? Where should the eye go? What does the tail feathers, what do their tail feathers look like? None of that, because somebody else did the thinking. All they had to do was glue on some pieces. This is not creative art. At the Mindmoves Institute, and I am absolutely positive at the Northwest University ECD faculty, a blank page is the best form or the best starting point for any kind of creative art. Because when there is a blank page, it invites you to think. It invites you to think, oh, to be analytical. What can I do here? It invites you to think, what can I do? What else can I do? How can I position? Which colors can I use? So the moment we produce and um, we give a child a blank page, we are inviting them to think. Remember, this session is about language literacy and we want them to think. But how do you think without language? You can think in pictures. And we're going to talk a lot about pictures this afternoon. But language literacy means we also want the child to think in language. So it's going to take us a while, but enjoy the journey with us this afternoon. So when we talk about creative art, what we're actually talking about is that blank page of any color that a child of any age falls in covers in whatever. Um, sorry, there's just a quickly do something this side. Um, whatever color and whatever shape they want to fill it with doesn't have to be skillful in the beginning. Just to use their eyes to guide their hands to land on the piece of paper is a miracle for a very young child. So creative art is about molding. It's about drawing with chalk, with mud, with crayon, in sand. It doesn't, you don't have to have loads of resources. The world is a massive resource. We, when we talk about creative art, we're talking about painting. And painting, free painting, finger painting, painting with tongs and cotton wool, painting your nails, all kinds of painting, uh, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> Which also means and includes Painting on different levels, sometimes when the table, flat on the table, sometimes slanted against an easel, because each of those, um, those means of, of painting or ways of painting has a marked different influence on the brain and on the sensory motor system. And when we talk ECD, we always talk the brain. But when we talk ECD, we talk sensory motor system. So can you imagine if a child is still young and you give them a car to drive through your paint to create roads? Do you know how many skills are involved? Eye hand coordination, laterality, crossing the midline, position and space. When we talk about creative art, we talk about tearing because we tear paper and we, we crumble them up way before we start cutting. And then what do we do? Oh, we first cut the shape ourselves. 
and then we do the crumbling up and then we do the sticking the tearing and the gluing and the sticking and then it is the reason why when we talk creative art we don't talk about one picture every single day a picture a work of art doesn't take an artist one 20 minute or 30 minute lesson it takes time and when it, it's layered with different textures one day you cut the white part another day you cut the yellow part and then you start tearing the beautiful colorful paper and maybe the same session you start forming it in small little balls and then maybe even on another day you glue them on so you end up with a multi-colored multi-textured butterfly it's all part of creative art and then we get to cutting as well cutting is incredibly important and i'll say a lot about cutting just now the thing with cutting and and with creating your own pizza slices isn't that the weirdest thing and the most divine con conversation you can have with preschool children when you say it's a pizza comes in a square box but a pizza is a circle and when you cut it it turns out to be triangles isn't every moment in ECD a marvelous opportunity to teach children to unlock the world and give it meaning you know David Feuerstein after the second world war he was a, um, he's a Jew and he was um, after the second world war he said there are only three things that a young child needs and the three things are in the following sequence a caring adult always a caring adult first not just an adult a caring adult who unlocks the world and gives it meaning so creative art gives us the opportunity in ecd to spend time with a small group of children while the other children are developing other skills elsewhere in the classroom but that small group of children are getting our undivided attention and not only are they get, getting our undivided attention, they also get the opportunity to interact, to listen, and to communicate. So everything, everything about literacy, language literacy, is wrapped up in a creative art session. And then I need to introduce this little teacher this afternoon. I love this picture, and I do apologize because the Picture quality isn't perfect, but he is just the most divine teacher. And I'm sure you've all noticed this, and not only in the three-year-old group, and not only in the four-year-old or two-year-old groups, but in grade R, grade one, grade two, grade three. I can even slide back and show you the same thing. Let me show you. It occurs with a teacher. Can you see this teacher's mouth? And can you see how she's thinking and using her mouth to guide her hands? So it's not just little children who use their mouths, like this little girl, to work in sync with their hands to create, to cre um, to create um, beautiful works of art. So one of the most important things that one needs to realize when it comes to language literacy is that nature gives every child the opportunity to develop. It gives every teacher the opportunity to guide children to develop in your, those children who are in your care. But then, our, my ECD colleagues, we have to know our story. We have to know what it is that we're doing on a daily basis. We have to know that when a child moves his or her mouth while they are using crayons, paint, play-doh, scrunching up pieces of paper or cutting, there's a reason for that. And it's simply telling you, it's giving you a glimpse in the child's language brain. Because when they battle to move the hands, they often recruit the mouth to support the hands, just like that teacher in that other um, picture that I showed you just now. So when you see a mouth, the jaw or the tongue is working in sync with hands, you know that child is still developing. It is natural 
it is a vital step in the development of a child's brain and sensory motor system. And I'll tell you why just now. Remember, we're first talking about creative art, then we're going to talk about coding, and then we talk about creative art as a form of coding. So when that child is battling, it is because how many mouths? One mouth, how many hands? Two. It's because the, the one mouth is used to support the two hands that are still not that coordinated and slightly clumsy. And you know, while that child is cutting, they are, this, let me go back, they are desperately trying to move those, the thumb and the index finger apart. But can you see how the child is recruiting the other three fingers to help that finger, the um, index finger to move the fingers apart? Because when a baby or a child moves their thumb in an opposite direction of the, uh, um, from the other fingers, it, it coincides with language development centers in the brain for years and years. I think it's since 2004 at our baby program at the Mount Moose Institute, we've noticed that when babies' thumbs start separating from the rest of their hands, it coincides, it's associated with language development. So when a, ba a baby is crawling, yes, they are crawling. It is a sensory motor activity. They are moving through their milestones, but it's way more than that. It is associated with the development of the physical hand. And this little hand, if you look at it, can you see if you move down the thumb? Let me see if I can find the cursor. If you move down the thumb and then to the right, can you see there's a capital letter, letter L? Yes, because when the thumb moves in opposition to the other fingers, it, it shows us that language development is seriously on its way. Because if it's not, the child still uses the hand as a paddle. So all the fingers then um, point in the exact same direction. So I'm quickly, briefly going to stop at the hand because it's such an important part of creative um, art and of language development, language literacy. So when we look at the thumb and the index finger, those two fingers are called the skilled fingers. They are the ones that wire together because they fire together. That's in neuroscience. They often use that term. Things that, neurons that wire, fire together, wire together. So as these, the thumb and the index finger work together when they glue, when they cut, when they draw, what are they doing? They're creating a mar marvelous teamwork between those two skillful fingers, which are very close to each other. So what about the other three fingers? That's the middle finger, the ring finger, and the baby finger, the little pinky. So those three are our supporting fingers. They stabilize the hand. So the two skillful fingers or skilled fingers can really work very hard. See, part of language literacy is writing. And that comes in with coding. But for the moment, we're just looking at the structure of the hand and how your daily creative art activities, not one, one directed by the teacher, but many other opportunities in your class for the children to, to experience and express themselves through creative art, through um, block construction, through car, playing with cars and all the other marvelous things in your classroom. But creative art specifically, incredibly important for language development. So now we can get to this very uncomfortable part of the talk where there's a lot of debate about how do you cut. Is it the colleagues, we need to know where we're on our way to. Because if we know where we're on our way to, then it's much easier to figure out what we should be doing right now. And if we are on our way to writing, it would be incorrect to teach a child to write. I'm going to just move that, that um, 
um, cross off the off the scissors so you can see clearly. Can you see the thumb is in the one part? The middle finger is in the other um, part of the scissors, and the index finger is guiding the scissors. Many people, many people say that is the way to cut. Well, is it the colleagues? If that's the truth, do not be surprised if that child battles with pencil grip later on. Because pencil grip is the interaction and the coordination between the thumb and the index finger, not the thumb and the middle finger. Because if you practice that, what you practice myelinates, that means it becomes a permanent skill. And if over for years we teach children to use your thumb and your middle finger and the index finger to guide the blade, then you are actually teaching the thumb and the middle finger to work together. And when you do that, what is the child's pencil grip going to look like? Where's this finger going? Can you see? That is not that's not preparing the body and the brain in the most optimal way. So what is? It's when we use the thumb and the index finger in opposition to do that kind of movement because that's neurophysiologically sound. Let me give you an experience. Won't you please just put your thumb and your index finger together like this and then just do a little bit of a movement like that and feel how coordinated and comfortable that feels. Now use your thumb and your middle finger and do the same. Can you feel it's not the same? It doesn't feel the same? It doesn't feel equally smooth and coordinated? It's because the thumb and the index fingers are the fingers that are closely associated with creative art. But language does not start with creative art, and it doesn't start with the hands, and it doesn't even start with a mouth that moves to support the hands. It starts when a baby is tiny and for many, many bumps listens to language. It starts with the ear, because you need to hear a language before you can babble in a language. Did you know that most children in the whole wide world, irrespective of their language, and babbles in a similar way? Yes, because it's all children are created in pretty much the same way. And then they learn to specialize in the sound system of the mother tongue or their primary language. And when this little girl in the middle that's really sitting and listening, well, when she grows up and she doesn't babble anymore, but she speaks beautifully, then she's really on her way to to coding. Now watch, even holding the can, can you see the four fingers separated from the thumb? So it's something that we naturally develop over time. So let's just wrap this up in a bit of a model. And I'm basing this on the model of Professor Lionel Postimus from UJ, where he says, when we look at li language literacy, oral language always precedes language, it, um, written language. It is so obvious that we actually don't talk about it very often. But if a child can't speak, listen, understand, and speak a language, how will they ever write it? So not only is oral language important, what are the two parts of it? You need to receive, um, inf um, you need to receive or hear language. And that is why it's so important that we pick up at a very early age if a child has any recurring problems with their ears. Because if there's a recurring ear infection, according to the neurophysiologist, Dr. Carla Hannaford, 94% um, of learning difficulties later are due to difficulties um, that arose as the result of recurring ear infection in the very early years. So if a child often has a runny nose, or if a child is often has a blocked nose, it's important for the parents to sort that out because it makes it very difficult for them to listen and hear the language clearly because the middle part of the ear is full of air to conduct sound clearly. But if there's fluid in that ear, if there's fluid in your nose, very often there's fluid in your ears. When there's fluid in the ears, it means that sound has to travel through, through liquid. 
And you know, if you're under the water, if you're swimming, it's nearly swimming season in South Africa. If you're swimming um, and you're under the water and somebody talks to you, you can hear they're talking. You can see their mouth, but it's, it's distorted. So if a child has recurring ear infection, the chances are excellent that they may battle to hear clearly and it will um, influence the production of language, which is in the oral tradition to be able to speak. So oral language is... Language is divided into the receptive part, listening, and the productive part, speaking. And what about written language? Ah, written language, re you receive written language through reading. And that's with your eyes, yes, but why is there a hand? And what if you're blind? And or you, if you've got low vision and you can't see, then you can use touch as a way of receiving language because then you can read Braille, for example. And the expressive productive phase of written language is to write. So this is common knowledge. And now we get to the part because my colleagues, I have a problem with this slide because it says we need the written language you need to read and then you need to write. Okay, I understand that. But when we look at our children in South Africa and we look at the poll's results and we look at what are the children really battling with in foundation phase, we see they battle with decoding because decoding is part of reading. R reading is to hear the sounds that somebody else put down on paper or screen. Think about it. Think about it. When you read, irrespective of if you use your eyes or your hands with Braille, what you want to pull out of the paper, out of from the book, or off the screen, is you want to pull out the sounds of the symbols. So decoding means to hear the sounds that the symbols, the ABC, and the words and the letters, on the page makes. So we say at the Mind Moves Institute, if you want to be good at co decoding, shouldn't you be coding first? Let's just stop and think about that. Five if minutes, Mindy. Pardon? Five I'm minutes sorry. remaining. Sorry to disturb you. Thank you. So, so if um, decoding is stumbling so many children up, isn't it maybe because they don't know how to code? Because writing means to represent sound with visual symbols or in this, in the case of Braille, with bumps, little bumps, so you can feel them. Ha! This afternoon, coding equals creative art because it's a pre-writing skill to represent sound with symbol pictures. Creative art is a form of coding. Every picture that a child draws or creates on a blank page is taking their thoughts, their thinking, their feelings, their experiences, and enabling them to convert it in code because a picture is a child's code. And sometimes it's a little bit more clear than others. I can just see this mom's attitude, stopping and looking at this and thinking, what on earth we have here but if you look at this picture and we try to decode we are reading her picture because don't children do that the moment they've drawn a picture can they tell you exactly what they've just written in an age-appropriate way drawing painting creative art is age-appropriate writing they're learning to convert sound and experiences into symbols this is a teacher you can see there's a teacher and i think she's a scientist because there's scientific um, apparatus on the table next to her. My dear ECD colleagues, if we want to understand, um, if no check box, focus on last. Um, if, if you want to, I'm sorry, there was just a message passed to me. Um, if you want learners in your class to convert their thoughts into pictures, they need to do that for years, for years at least three years before they'll be able to convert the sounds that words are made of and the words that sentences are made of. They will be only be able to do that if they've practiced
for at least three years to convert thoughts into picture symbols. And then when they face a page like this and we teach them the lion on the left-hand side represents left and the red dot on the right represents their red hand, um, not their red hand, their right hand, they are facing a screen. So we are seeing the back of their body. Can you see their feet are planted firmly on the, on the ground? And they are facing away from us. Can you see there are no eyes, no nose, no mouth? It's because they're facing away from you. And if we then teach them in grade R to, after loads of creative art, to convert the letters of the sounds that they've playfully discovered into sound symbols which are not their own. So they have to do it all in exactly the same way. They never draw a man in a, or a, a picture in exactly the same way. But when it comes to writing, it has to be the same. It's not their symbols. We need to teach children the code of the language before they can decode in grade one. And experience success. Isn't that why we are teaching in ECD? It's to, to ensure that our learners, when they go to grade one and a teacher asks a question, with shiny eyes and without any hesitation, they can pinpoint sounds because they've learned that the picture sounds, that, that sounds has all have pictures and those pictures have to be consistent. I thank you.